Well, at the risk of sounding like a college professor, <laughs> which is exactly what I am, uh, trying to call the class to order here, get the attention of all my students, and I'm happy to see at least some of the students who are here uh, who survived an 8 a.m. class with me this morning, which is saying something. But uh, I think I know many of you in the room here. My name is Jim Hollifield. I'm a professor and the director of the Tower Center. And uh, <clears throat> we've got a couple of programs today. This first one, the luncheon program on China and COVID, uh, which I think a relatively non-controversial topic. Uh, but if you think this is not controversial, come tonight. We're having a program on the, on the Middle East uh, this evening. So lots of things going on in the world. Uh, so uh, this is part of a series, a lecture series, research program on uh, Japan and East Asia. It's called the Sun and Star Program. It goes back to the 1990s. Some of you in the room may be old enough like me to remember the 1990s. Um, but uh, it's a great program, uh, and uh, I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague. Uh, I always refer to him as Takayuchi Sensei, uh, since he is from Japan, and he's going to introduce our speaker, maybe say a few words about Sun and Star. Uh, so uh, let me just again welcome you to the SMU campus, uh, and I uh, uh, hope you're enjoying this beautiful fall weather and this beautiful campus. So Hiroki. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Hiroki Takeuchi. Uh, I'm a director of Sandstar program on Japan East Asia uh, at the SMU Tower Center. Um, well, one thing that I say about Sandstar program is uh, uh, so Sun represents Japan, uh, Star represents Texas, and then this is the center uh, working on uh, um, East Asian politics um, and the policies. Uh, and uh, but uh, it has a, uh, we have a, um, a generous support uh, from Japan Foundation and Japan Airlines. So uh, we put uh, when uh, we were uh, expanding the scope uh, from the Japanese studies into uh, East Asian studies uh, in 2014, uh, we discussed um, how to uh, expand and then we, we discussed a new name for the program. And uh, we talked about uh, talked with um, with uh, Ambassador Schieffer, former ambassador to Japan, as well as uh, Admiral Patrick Walsh, former uh, commander of Pacific Fleet. Uh, and then uh, we, decide, uh, we agreed that uh, Japan is still important um, to, um, to ma for the United States to manage China. And uh, so that's why uh, we keep the name Japan uh, in the name of the program. So uh, we call it the Sandstar Program on Japan East Asia. And uh, as long as I know, uh, this is the only East Asia program in the nation that has Japan before East Asia. Uh, Fitch actually, our uh, Consul General of Japan in Houston, really likes. Um, one more thing, uh, I think that today, like uh, most of the um, guests, uh, um, uh, guests are uh, from uh, Texas and from uh, DFW, uh, but uh, when there are so many uh, outside guests, um, I usually emphasize that uh, uh, it is Sun Star program, and the star has to be singular because we are in Texas. Um, so um, I'm delighted uh, to introduce uh, today's speaker, um, Dr. Martin Dimitrov. Um, he's uh, my uh, old friend, uh, and we now realize that uh, uh, we have, since we have we met, like it has taken like now almost 20 years. Um, when I was a graduate student, uh, my advisor said that if you met somebody and then made friends with somebody, um, then like uh, she or he will be a, a, a friend for um, life. And uh, Martin is uh, such a friend. Um, and we met in Beijing uh, when we were both doing uh, field research in 2004. And then since then, like we met um, in various occasions, uh, especially in the conferences, uh, we organized a conference together. He came to um, SMU to speak a few times, and so w welcome back. Uh, and then also, uh, I also had an opportunity to uh, speak at the Turin University too. Um, so um, 
when we organized this uh, event, uh, originally uh, we, I didn't uh, expect that um, uh, Middle East event uh, would be scheduled uh, today. Uh, and then what I even didn't expect even more uh, was uh, um, I didn't think uh, um, um, China event would be would look uh, not controversial. <laughs> uh, and uh, another thing that I didn't expect was uh, I didn't expect that like, uh, um, in the game against terrain uh, today, uh, this uh, weekend uh, will become a kind of championship game of the conference. Um, and uh, but uh, so uh, Professor Dimitrov is uh, uh, now a chair of the political science department of the terrain university. Uh, he was uh, before that he was teaching at Dartmouth College. Uh, he got a PhD from uh, Stanford University. Um, he has uh, two books, so um, um, about uh, single authored books. Um, one is, uh, first book is Piracy and State. Uh, this is talking about the politics of intellectual property rights in China, very interesting topic. And then um, the book that I really enjoyed was the most recent book, uh, which was published this year, uh, Dictatorship and Information, and uh, talking about how um, uh, communist regimes in actually China and also Bulgaria uh, are um, dealing with uh, information, uh, which is actually always a problem for dictator, uh, dictatorship because uh, dictators usually um, only listen to like, good things because like, uh, people around dictators tend to say like, only good things um, because like, they want to please the, the leader, right? So, uh, so that's actually uh, usually the dilemma of the uh, authoritarian leader and he actually does uh, a lot of uh, nice um, um, archival works. And he has, uh, this book shows uh, uh, his, uh, his capability of many things, but one of them is his language ability. Uh, he has, I think, six languages? Uh, you have, uh, and um, um, so uh, English, Chinese, and then of course, and then he is originally from Bulgaria, so uh, he has Bulgarian, and then German, Russian, and uh, and French, I think, or, yeah. So, uh, uh, and then, so, uh, so a lot of like, uh, so um, sources are uh, from like various languages. I'm very uh, impressed. And then, uh, so this is a very interesting book. I, I had an opportunity to uh, discuss his book in the conference uh, this January, and then I really uh, enjoyed. So, uh, so today uh, he's going to talk about Chinese politics in the post-COVID era. Um, actually, so he has visited uh, China actually three times uh, since pandemic, uh, and that is actually very rare. Um, I have never uh, had an opportunity to go back to China uh, for the field research uh, since pandemic, uh, and then many of the researchers are like that. And then, but then, as you know, U.S.-China relations uh, is uh, quite tense. Uh, but then we have to make a decision. Uh, we have to make decisions, policy decisions, without knowing so much um, uh, about uh, China because we didn't have uh, many opportunities to go to China thanks to uh, because of COVID. So uh, it's very um, interesting uh, report about Chinese politics in the post-COVID era, which is very important uh, for our uh, national security policy and our uh, foreign policy making. Uh, please join me for uh, welcoming Dr. Uh, Dimit uh, Martin Dimitrov. I uh, want to thank uh, Professor Takeuchi for this uh, extremely uh, generous uh, introduction and also for the invitation to uh, visit um, SMU uh, again. I'm also very grateful to uh, the Tower Center and to Professor Holyfield for uh, their hospitality and to the Sun and Star program that Professor Takeuchi is running. And thank you all for uh, coming today for this uh, non-controversial talk, which will be delivered in English. Um, so um, Chinese politics in the post-COVID era. Only a year ago, uh, the proposition that there might be a post-COVID era uh, would have sounded very strange because China was in the midst of lockdowns and visiting China was impossible. So we remember those images of the um, uh, people wearing white clothing and all of the blockades in residential compounds in major Chinese cities. But we also remember the second and the third image on this slide, which is the A4 or white paper protests that started literally a year ago, end of November uh, 2022. And they led to the repeal of the dynamic zero COVID policy in December of 22. And then China gradually opened up. 
So it opened up to visitors. Um, and I had the opportunity to uh, go this summer with the National Committee on United States-China Relations. It's an entity that is doing track two diplomacy and has existed since before the ping pong matches. In fact, they were instrumental in organizing the ping pong matches uh, in the early 70s when there were no formal diplomatic relations with China. And then I went uh, for on two other trips for, for conferences. So those were not research trips, but it was very exciting for me to be able to go back to China after four years of not uh, having the opportunity to visit the country. And I expected to see a place that I didn't recognize. So what I will do today is I will argue that China after COVID in most ways is similar to China before COVID except the anxiety about the economy, social discontent, party building, the problems with Taiwan. And then the last thing that I'll talk about on this slide, cultural security, I will explain what that is. The anxiety has increased. So it was the same place, except all the pre-existing problems had become uh, more um, severe. And there was um, a general sense of uncertainty in, in most of my interlocutors. And so the first four things that I will talk on this slide are in the news. There are things that we hear about quite a bit. So I will offer my views on, on, on what the problems are in these areas. And then the fifth one, cultural security, is something that we don't hear about. Um, but um, this is uh, essentially about the danger of um, uh, external ideas, um, the way that they're perceived by the Chinese leadership. This is something I'm very interested in, so I will define it and I will explain why it matters for understanding China today. So to start off with the obvious point of the economy, China, as we all know, is huge. There is a lot of variation in China. There are images like these, so the supermodern China, the advanced China, and then there are images that um, suggest that not every uh, uh, Chinese province is um, uh, equally developed. The general trend when we look at China's economic development has been of um, four decades of high levels of growth, but um, as we all know, growth has recently slowed down, and this is one of the major anxieties in, in the economic realm. China this year is expected to reach no higher than 5% GDP growth, which to all of us might look like a big number. But in the Chinese context, this is a relatively low level of growth. And uh, what the Chinese leadership wants to be able to do is to deliver high levels of growth in order to uh, lead to a quicker recovery from the slowdown during the COVID uh, period. China, for the first time ever since reform and opening began in the late 1970s, registered negative foreign direct investment in the last quarter, so in the third quarter of 2023. There was more money, foreign money, leaving China than coming in. This is an unprecedented trend, and it, it, it feeds the economic uncertainty that is um, uh, very much in evidence in China. The Belt and Road Initiative, uh, a massive uh, infrastructural uh, project where China invested in 100 countries around the world, um, uh, is winding down uh, when we look at long-term trends less and less money is being spent on belt and road initiative projects uh, there's extraordinary high levels of local debt uh, in china the construction sector why should we worry about the construction sector because this is one of the main investment vehicles for chinese households they buy apartments and the construction sector is experiencing extraordinary uncertainty um, uh, big construction companies are have either their bankruptcy or they are on the verge of bankruptcy. And finally, China has more billionaires than the United States, but Chinese billionaires have hit upon some hard times and a number of them have been detained, arrested and, and jailed. And those are slightly different terms, but all, all of them suggest that the uncertainty amongst the Chinese business elite is increasing. And of course, um, these arrests and uh, incarcerations um, are driven by an anti-corruption campaign that the current Chinese leader has waged uh, for the last decade since he assumed office. So on the economic front, um, there are challenges um, and um, there, there was anxiety about the economy before COVID, but it has become more, um, it has become deeper. So moving on to my second point, uh, beyond the economy, there are challenges on the um, socioeconomic front. 
So China is, uh, is huge and we do have the images from the major cities, but we also have um, some poverty left and underdevelopment. Now, um, when we think about socioeconomic problems, um, there are different ways of presenting this problem. And given that we have a mixed audience with some students in the room, I will start by talking about the problems that the youth are experiencing in China. So youth urban unemployment became such a sensitive matter that the latest statistics we have on this issue are from June of this year. And afterwards, numbers stopped being released because uh, they were too sensitive. But as of June 2023, the unemployment rate between the 16 to 24 year olds was 21.3%. This is extremely high for the Chinese context. So what Chinese youth are doing is they're lying flat. They're waiting it out and they're becoming disenchanted um, with, with the current state of, 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 of the Chinese economy. Um, extremely high apartment prices. This is a source of, of dissatisfaction. It is very difficult for young Chinese um, uh, urban residents to imagine buying an apartment if they don't have um, support from uh, their parents. There's also the problem of the 996 work culture. You work nine to nine, six days a week, uh, extraordinary pressure in the, in, the, in the urban areas. And there is a generally negative outlook that um, young people have, and also not so young people um, uh, have due to the uh, economic slowdown uh, in China. So I'm not going to present statistics on protests in China because those also, the numbers are too sensitive and they stopped being released more than a decade ago. So my numbers would be old. Um, but what I want to talk about is this general problem of dealing with social discontent and the, some of the more innovative techniques that the Chinese um, government has implemented um, as a way of preemptively um, um, uh, addressing um, areas of discontent. So about 20 years ago, um, China introduced the so-called grid policing system. Um, so in urban areas, and this eventually got extended to rural areas as well, neighborhoods uh, form a grid, and every grid has a grid representative. Here is a photograph of your friendly grid representative in Guangzhou. This is an image that I took uh, in 2016. Um, he can be reached in various ways, uh, by, by, by phone, uh, but also um, um, uh, in, in other ways. And he's responsible for um, generally supervising the neighborhood and making sure that everything is in order. So what's interesting about this grid system is that it has extended beyond policing to the management of socioeconomic issues. So the grid management system in China combines surveillance function with the functions of public goods provision. And the public goods in question include conflict mediation. In China, this is considered a public good, um, and, but they also include um, problems with sanitation and uh, public health. Um, um, um. Now, to operate, the system requires both staff, like your friendly uh, grid coordinator, but also volunteers who uh, go about their neighborhoods and they, they uh, assess uh, uh, the existence of various problems. And it requires um, the technologically enabled uh, transmission of information. And so in recent years, the grid management system has been upgraded through these all in one government apps. And the ones that I've listed here are from Beijing and from Zhejiang province. Uh, Zhejiang province, by the way, is a pioneer in all sorts of digital governance. And there is um, um, some debate among China scholars as to why this took place. And many argue that China's current leader before he became the leader of China was the governor of Zhejiang province. So whether this has something to do with the pioneering of these all in one digital innovations, we don't know for sure, but but a lot of them do come from from Zhejiang. And so these all in one government apps allow citizens to transmit information about local governance problems that are then uh, sent back to the grid for resolution. Um, just as the pandemic was taking off, but there's no link between the pandemic and this new policy because the policy was unrolled a few months before COVID, um, there was this new policy of, we don't really have a good way of translating Pingan Zhong Wo Jian She. So the construction of a peaceful China or Pingan China, there, there are different ways of translating it in English. But um, the idea is that we have this grassroots social governance where citizens are detecting problems locally, 
reviving the Feng Chao experience of, of local self-management, um, and, and, and then um, they're, they're resolving them at the local level. And so um, using, using technology. So the big question as we're moving forward is whether grid governance and its most recent upgrade into this peaceful or ping on China uh, could be used to diffuse social discontent. So is technology sufficient to nip discontent in the bud and to uh, preempt it from um, escalating into, into protests and the like? Um, this, is, this is a big um, uh, question mark as we look at China's future. I will move on to the third topic uh, where, you know, these, these issues, uh, of course, pre-exist um, um, and they become um, more um, um, seriously expressed uh, during the pandemic, uh, party building. China, as we all know, although we sometimes forget, is a single party state ruled by the Chinese Communist Party, which had last fall during the lockdowns, its 20th party Congress, when Xi Jinping was, um, he, 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 um, he uh, stayed for a third term as a general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> so he's firmly in control, but there are some interesting trends in what in Chinese is known as party building. So creating party structures, recruiting new party members and um, a surprising uh, result is that the Chinese Communist Party has fewer applicants for membership, and I have um, I will speak more about this in Professor Takeuchi's class tonight. Normally, when I present uh, this graph, uh, I'm told, "Oh, but there are fewer younger people," and it, this it doesn't explain the, the decline in membership. So this is not that there are fewer younger people for complex reasons, young people um, and others, because the party is not only open to young people, are less willing to to apply for membership in the Chinese Communist Party. This is a concern for the party because it is committed to increasing its members. Something else, uh, we may think that the Chinese Communist Party and civil society organizations, also known as NGOs in English, those are incompatible, but the Chinese Communist Party doesn't think so. So for the last um, um, decade, it has been assiduously building party committees in non-governmental organizations. And uh, when I was in China this summer, a lot of our meetings were with these NGOs and, you know, we got to ask questions and my question was always about party building, which resulted in considerably considerable uh, anxiety among among our hosts and why exactly are you asking about party building well because there's a party plaque that says you know you do have a party committee here and i'd like to know how it helps with uh, civil society work but what's interesting about party building is that these party committees have declined in the last few years this is a trend that has not been noted in the literature in either english or chinese so we don't have a clear sense about what is going on there but there are fewer of those party committees and the other trend is that party building in private firms also appears to have um, retreated. Again, private firms with a party presence, well, this is China, and the Chinese Communist Party is quite committed in uh, creating um, uh, uh, these structures in private firms in order to um, have a foothold there and as, as a mechanism of, of controlling the operation of these firms. But importantly, these party committees have been declining. So on the party building front, there are some trends that are um, a source of concern. And then we have a question to which there is no answer, but I put it there in order to perhaps provoke some questions from the public at the end. And the question is whether the size of the Chinese Communist Party has peaked. Um, there are no textbooks that tell us how big a Communist Party should be, but we do have some historical examples. Professor Takeuchi mentioned that I'm from Bulgaria, so Bulgaria is on this slide, um, uh, just randomly uh, chosen. Um, the, the Communist Party there was bigger as a percentage of the population. It reached um, and slightly surpassed 10%. But in revolutionary regimes like Cuba and China, uh, the Communist Party appears to reach about 7%. This was also the size of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. Right before it collapsed, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union had reached 6.8%. So this may be um, the... Um, 
the optimal size for a communist party in a revolutionary regime. In the non-revolutionary, they reach and surpass 10%. So with all of this emphasis on party building, perhaps the party has reached uh, its maximum extent. Um, but, um, but this is something that is on the mind of, of the leadership. Is this, uh, is this the right size or do they need more people? Now, um, moving on to Taiwan and the military matters. Um, again, this is an area where there was um, um, significant concern before COVID and the concern remains. Um, Taiwan is um, a, a major source of um, attention between the United States and China, obviously. There was a moment when the relationship between mainland China and uh, Taiwan became warmer. This was during the last KMT administration, but uh, Ma, President Ma, stepped down in January 2016. So since then, we have had President Tsai, uh, who was re-elected in 2020. And now we're moving towards elections. Taiwan will have elections on January 13th, and it is not clear who will win. So as of a week ago, it seemed that the opposition would be able to coordinate. And um, what we know in comparative politics is that opposition coordination diminishes the chances of the incumbent party of re-election. So despite these smiley faces and goodwill gestures, the efforts of um, the KMT, uh, currently an opposition party, and the Taiwan People's Party to agree on a common candidate to challenge the Democratic uh, Progressive Party, those efforts failed. So now the two parties, the KMT and the Taiwan People's Party, will field separate candidates, which of course will diminish their chances of um, uh, winning an electoral victory in 2024. Why does this matter? Because uh, if the KMT uh, wins uh, power again in Taiwan, um, uh, the KMT is more friendly towards um, mainland um, China. So what are the things to watch for as we're thinking about um, China's future, um, economic growth and social discontent are certainly areas that one has to uh, uh, keep track of. Uh, the slowdown in party growth, what exactly is happening there and what are the implications uh, for, for the future. Um, certainly the outcome of the January elections in Taiwan, the outcome of the November 24 US elections, depending on who wins uh, policy towards um, Taiwan and China would vary. Um, there is a growing sense um, in the policy community that um, 2027 is the year by which uh, mainland China will be capable of launching an invasion of Taiwan. Is an invasion of Taiwan likely soon as a diversionary tactic? Those are questions um, to think about as we move into the future. So I have run through the four uh, parts of this uh, brief um, talk, uh, which are things that are in the news. And now I'm going to move to the fifth, which is cultural security, which is not something that one reads about in the New York Times or The Economist or your favorite source of news. But it's something that keeps me up at night, and it's something that that I am I am um, uh, very interested in, and so I will explain what it is and why it matters for understanding some of the anxieties of the Chinese Communist Party. So, protecting cultural security in contemporary China. What I will first talk about is the war of ideas. Why do ideas matter? And what is this war of ideas? Um, then I will talk about uh, cultural threats, the way that they're understood by China, and both a hard defense towards this cultural threat. And I will also talk about softer counteroffensive strategies that involve the promotion of indigenous cultural consumption and cultural soft power. And then I will conclude with some final thoughts on what I call the hard turn in cultural security under Xi Jinping. So what is culture or um, as it's known in Chinese? So in Chinese, this is a very broad concept. And I was asked by an editor to define what I mean by culture. So I went to the Xinhua dictionary, which defines culture in the following way. Culture, it, the dictionary says, is the sum of material and spiritual wealth created by human beings 
in the process of their social and historical development, especially spiritual wealth like philosophy, technology, education, literature, the arts, etc. So this is a huge range of, um, of, 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 of different activities uh, in the material and, and spiritual uh, realm. So because culture is so broadly defined um, in, 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 in Chinese understandings, the examples of cultural threats are quite large, uh, quite broad rather. And what I've done here is I've only put three. Um, so European languages, Japanese anime and blockchain technology. So what unites these? Well, they're foreign. Um, and they're seen, and you know, I mean, there's actual research on this. So in, in something that I've written, I, I cite um, specific um, examples from the scholarly literature in Chinese that is quite clear that these are actual cultural, cultural threats. And then scholars, because there's quite a bit of research on cultural um, security um, uh, among, among Chinese scholars, these scholars also prevent, uh, pr provide examples of counteroffensive tools. So the counteroffensive tools would be indigenous Chinese technology, so Huawei technology, Chinese language, as opposed to European languages, Chinese food, and traditional Chinese medicine. And, and those are just some examples. So this is, um, um, this is here so that we know what we're talking about in terms of culture, cultural threats, uh, and counteroffensive tools. So to go back to this notion of the war of ideas, in 1950, the National Security Council um, issued a document that clarified that currently there is uh, 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 um, a tension between the idea of freedom, which was associated with Western democratic values, and the idea of slavery, which was exemplified by communist regimes. So from the 50s until Fukuyama declared the end of history, uh, which turns out didn't quite end, um, there was this, this battle between uh, the West and Western notions of freedom and, and the communist world. So, um, those tensions didn't end uh, with 89 and uh, contemporary China is an example of why um, external cultural influences are seen as a threat and of the countermeasures that can be deployed to blunt uh, um, these external um, ideological influences. So I will first talk about the evolution of um, the ideas of um, um, protecting cultural security uh, in China. So cultural protection is not a new notion um, in China. This goes back to the 1950s. But um, the discourse um, about cultural threats got re-energized with the collapse of communism. So after 1989, um, the idea of hostile foreign forces um, became firmly entrenched in Chinese writings about um, cultural security. And this idea of hostile foreign forces continues to the current day. So these white paper or A4 protests that were on my second slide, the ones that, that helped uh, end uh, zero COVID were portrayed as an event instigated by hostile foreign forces. In 2013, um, uh, document number nine was issued by the Central Committee that talked about the danger of universal values, um, notions um, like democracy, uh, the rule of law, uh, freedom of speech, and the idea that these universal values are presenting a threat to, uh, to China. In 2015, cultural security became a part of national security and Chinese national and state security are used interchangeably. It's the same term that is translated as either national or state security in English. So what we have today is the interchangeable use of the notions of cultural security, ideological security, and political security. So ideas are politically dangerous, or they can be. And the ideological sphere is um, um, an inalienable part of the uh, political um, sphere. Um, so cultural and political security are, are um, um, used uh, interchangeably. Uh, here we have a cartoon, you can't read it, but uh, because it's, it's a poor quality image, but what we have is um, obviously um, a game of Go is being played by um, a foreigner and his um, Chinese partner. 
And what we have in the middle is the um, Chinese um, cultural position. Um, and the Chinese uh, partner in this game of Go says that I will not be relying on the Great Wall to resist your influence. So the question is, if we're not going to use a Great Wall to prevent the impact of uh, Western culture, what can be done on the hard defensive front? So in terms of the institutions for protecting cultural security, um, historically, um, this is um, something that has been part of the mandate of the Ministry of Public Security. Um, so cultural security was an integral component of political security, the way that this was understood by the Ministry of Public Security. In 83, China created, in addition to the Ministry of Public Security, a Ministry of State Security that took some of the cultural security portfolio, but the Ministry of Public Security to this day um, has cultural protection departments that form an integral part of the state protection system. And these departments have full-time staff and part-time informants. Um, and in the book, um, in this big thick book that came out earlier this year that Professor um, uh, Takeuchi uh, pointed to, I, I, I devote some time to talking about, um, um, there are a lot of boring details, uh, about the uh, Ministry of Public and State Security and what they do in the, uh, in the sphere of cultural security. So I will spare you that. And, um, I will move, I will move um, towards some of the specific strategies for contracting hostile foreign forces. One is censorship. Of course, this is something that um, you read about uh, quite a bit in the news. The techniques used to censor content are um, extremely sophisticated and they range from um, the rather crude removal of content to uh, more sophisticated uh, mechanisms for uh, shifting attention and, and just flooding consumers with um, information that the regime is more interested in, in, in these consumers uh, 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 reading than the offending content that they're looking for. And so one, one technique is censorship. Another one is um, NGOs. Uh, they're considered to be uh, a vector for um, um, hostile foreign forces. There are quite strict registration rules, uh, especially for foreign NGOs. And the number of foreign NGOs operating in China has greatly diminished, uh, and the operations have been restricted to uh, apolitical um, areas. Um, other techniques involve the deployment of full-time staff and part-time informants. Um, the signification of religion, just yesterday, uh, the uh, Wall Street Journal had um, a big piece on the signification of Islam. So mosques uh, from the outside appear less and less like mosques. They appear like traditional Chinese buildings. But these plans for the signification of religion do not only apply to Islam, they apply to uh, um, uh, Catholicism and Protestant uh, Protestantism. And in, in China, they're, 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 these are separately regulated. Um, but in, um, as an echo of times past, uh, these plans are five-year plans. Um, so there's a five-year plan for the signification of Islam, five-year plan for the signification of um, uh, Catholicism and five-year plan for the signification of, of Protestantism. So um, religion is, of course, seen as a vector for external influence. And um, the thinking is that by signifying it, um, by um, insisting that in religious sermons, um, those the congregation uh, gets to hear about the most recent decisions of the party Congress, for instance. And this is not a joke. This is in the five-year plans. Uh, the idea is that uh, that religion will be will be signified, um, and and finally um, um, uh, portraying the um, white paper or A4 revolution as instigated by foreign forces. So these are some examples of contracting um, hostile uh, foreign forces. Um, more interesting, I think, um, are the soft counteroffensive measures because what these soft counteroffensive measures involve is the promotion of Chinese culture as an antidote to uh, these external cultural influences. Um, so China just passed a patriotic education law that has a very broad mandate, and it uh, enters into force on uh, January 1st. It also passed amendments to the Public Security Administration Punishment Law. And you might think, Public Security Administration Punishment Law. Well, what's relevant there is that Fines can be imposed for wearing offensive clothing. 
Uh, this began a couple of years ago when um, somebody photographed herself in a Japanese kimono and this offended, offended the feelings of the Chinese people or so said Chinese social media. So uh, clothing uh, can be offensive. Um, other other um, techniques uh, on the counteroffensive front involve resisting linguistic hegemony. Uh, this, of course, is code for the linguistic hegemony of English, and uh, Mandarin is uh, promoted um, as um, um, uh, an antidote. Um, there is also the promotion of indigenous cultural production. Um, so instead of consuming Western fashions, uh, patriotic um, Chinese are um, uh, um, expected to consume um, Chinese fashions, uh, which of course, I mean, the quality of, 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 of some of these products uh, has tremendously increased, um, as has their price. Um, so um, the, the general um, sense is that by fostering cultural pride, prom promoting cultural confidence, um, the Chinese um, Communist Party will be able to build soft power. Um, so these are some examples of these soft counteroffensive uh, measures. This first one is about Chinese clothing. Um, and then um, uh, April 15th in China is um, National Security Day um, in, in China. So um, part of um, national or, or state security is uh, promoting uh, cultural security. That's, that's, the, that's the second uh, poster over there. Um, so what the Chinese government is interested in is uh, promoting national pride and um, spectacles like the 2008 Olympics are quite helpful uh, for that. Um, China is also interested in projecting um, its um, soft power. So this is not only for a domestic audience, there is also an international dimension to it. In the last year, Xi Jinping has developed three global uh, initiatives, the Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative, and the Global Civilization Initiative. Um, I will not go into detail on any of these, but um, the um, idea behind them is that countries will join uh, in, these, in these global uh, initiatives and China will lead by promoting uh, these um, um, global initiatives. Um, there is a lot of thinking in the China community as to whether China is capable of exporting its model. And oftentimes when I read that work, I, I, I wonder what the model is. And, and I feel that we have to specify what we mean by the model. And then we have to be careful about um, who the adopter is. Um, sometimes this research on exporting the Chinese model looks at exporting cameras. And what we can say is, well, there are many countries that produce cameras. Um, and we have both democratic and authoritarian regimes that buy cameras from both the United States and from China. So if it's just about the cameras, you know, this, this is perhaps a very simplistic way of thinking about it. Um, and then what China is doing is it is oftentimes exporting the software that goes with the camera. It is training staff how to use the software. It is creating these safe cities around the world and so on and so forth. So um, I, I've written this little piece comparing China and Rwanda. And Rwanda is an unusual case. But um, what, what I was thinking there is that Rwanda is, is a good case to think about the possibility of exporting the Chinese model because the adopter in many ways is similar to China. Um, it, is, it has a hierarchically organized party that keeps winning 97% uh, in, in the elections. Rwanda has elections next year. We expect that uh, the RPF will win again 97 or 98% of the vote. It has a long history of analog grassroots surveillance that is similar to the Baojia system in China and has a competent bureaucracy with high levels of GDP growth. Um, uh, so this is on the exporting of, of, of the model. Um, and if, if there is interest, perhaps we can take this in the Q&A. But I promise Professor Takeuchi that I will not go past one o'clock or not very much. So I have only a couple of remaining um, slides. Um, so I'll talk about the hard turn. Uh, so um, uh, Xi Jinping um, um, celebrated the uh, 100th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party um, in 2021. And the centenary speech um, emphasized cultural security. It emphasized the capacity of the Chinese Communist Party 
to survive um, 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 foreign um, uh, infiltration and, and various um, other um, external uh, attacks. So there is a commitment uh, to block the various vectors of foreign ideological infiltration, like labor NGOs, citizen journalism, um, to continue with the existing internet restrictions, um, computer games have been declared off limits um, um, past a certain amount of time. Uh, foreign educational businesses um, have been uh, largely driven out of existence and androgynous TV stars have been banned. So some of these vectors we might, we might wonder about um, and certainly the long-term viability of these strategies is uncertain. So, um, is this a threat to cultural security? I will leave it to you to, uh, to decide, but um, they're banned, uh, these types of androgynous um, stars. And so what I argued today is that what we have after COVID is a more anxious China. I don't see a radical break with um, the pre-existing um, concerns and trends in terms of the development of the economy, in terms of social discontent, in terms of certain challenges in party building, in terms of the increasing tensions with Taiwan, or in terms of the ongoing importance of maintaining cultural security. So on that note, I thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Oh, thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, kick off the question, uh, very short question, but uh, uh, maybe like hard to answer, but uh, could you talk about the uh, impact on um, foreign policy of China? Uh, so um, hard turn in cultural security under Xi Jinping and uh, more anxious post-COVID China. Um, what impact does it have on uh, Chinese foreign policy? Um, thank you, Professor Takeuchi. Uh, this, of course, is a is a very important question, but it's it's a it's a it's a hard one to to answer because I feel that uh, especially when it comes to foreign policy, I do domestic and in the China field we do have a, a bit of a division of labor between people that do uh, foreign policy and those that work on domestic. It's hard to know what is driving foreign policy, but certainly a country that is less certain, a country that feels a greater deal of insecurity is more likely to engage in more aggressive foreign behavior. Um, and we see that um, Chinese activities in the South China Sea are becoming more aggressive. China is becoming more aggressive towards its neighbors. So, um, and, and there is this growing anxiety about what might happen uh, in Taiwan in the coming years, which of course is linked to what happens in, in Taiwan itself, what happens in the United States, but it's also driven by some of these uh, domestic concerns. So um, diversionary um, uh, foreign policy is something that we're all familiar with in democracies as well as in autocracies. Um, so that's, that's certainly a possibility when we're looking into the future. Okay, uh, who wants to start? Uh, so yeah, uh, please wait for the microphone and then also please identify yourself. Afternoon, what's the chance you find of a cultural shock with individual Chinese citizens losing roughly half their net worth in the sense that they were forced to buy into real estate markets in China that are collapsing? Nobody wants to talk about it. But if the mass Chinese population loses half its, half its net, net worth within a year, what do you see? Do you see that as a probable? And if so, what are the results culturally and everything? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, I think culturally it probably would have no impact, but economically and socially the impact would be huge. Um, and uh, certainly the um, Chinese government is, uh, and, and the Chinese Communist Party is deeply aware of that fact, which is why we were expecting bankruptcies of uh, construction firms to occur last fall and they didn't there was a bankruptcy but it's not of the biggest firm so what i expect is that the government would do its best to bail out these firms in order to prevent precisely this problem which would have huge huge social uh, consequences yep all day. Thank you for your presentation. I'm Brian Melanfi, Professor and Chair of the Division of Art. You mentioned uh, 
linguistic hegemony uh, with regard to English. Is, could you uh, put a little detail on that? My, my, I wonder about uh, simplified and traditional Mandarin, how that, how, that, how that might play a role in that. Right. Um, so um, the so so that's interesting. Um, and um, I um, this issue of cultural security is 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 part of a of a of a short book that I'm I'm completing for uh, on on the adaptability of the Chinese Communist Party. And um, when the the reviews came back, uh, what the um, the editors wanted me to emphasize is that. What China is threatened by is primarily English, um, although um, other other foreign languages, because they are the carriers of ideas, are seen as a concern. But what it emphasizes in response is Mandarin rather than Cantonese, for instance, which is something that came out during the review process. And what it's emphasizing is simplified Chinese characters rather than traditional Chinese characters, because the traditional Chinese characters are associated with places like Taiwan, um, Hong Kong, um, and, and, and also they're, they're not sufficiently tied to the Chinese um, Communist Party. Um, so, um, right, uh, what, what is being emphasized is um, Mandarin written in simplified characters. Go ahead. Hello, uh, Ken Beach. You, uh, you mentioned about the, uh, the Global Soft Power Initiative and then also about the Belt and Road, mm -hmm. which I think is tied in with that. Yeah. And it's winding down. So as it winds down, um, what do you think? Is China going to reap the profit and positive returns from that investment? And if yes, how much, how are they going to do it, and how long? Um, thanks for the question. Um, I wish I wish I knew. So let me let me do my best to uh, to answer the question, and I will disentangle the the cultural aspect from the economic. So China's global promotion of soft power is not only linked to investment um, in in things like infrastructural projects um, and, and 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 such. Um, it's also linked to the promotion of Chinese language globally. And this is done through Confucius Institutes, for instance. Uh, what we know about the Confucius Institutes is that the project failed in the United States. There are currently five left, and there were way over 100 Confucius Institutes. But in places like Africa and uh, portions of, of Asia, these Confucius Institutes remain. So there is um, ongoing interest amongst the, the residents of these of these countries to study Chinese, their ongoing initiatives to bring um, students from from Africa and parts of Asia to China. So we can think of, of that aspect of, of the initiative. There's also um, Chinese influence over media in Africa and Asia, and that is not widely uh, known uh, and not particularly well understood, but it's, it's certainly ongoing. So through these mechanisms, I think the, the influence is there and it, and it will continue. When it comes to the economic, it's unclear. Um, it seems that a lot of these investments were wasteful. Um, uh, they were, some of them were loans that countries have to repay and they're incapable of repaying. So the economic effectiveness of the projects appears to be lower than what the Chinese government expected, which may in fact be one of the key drivers for why this program is winding down, because economically it's, it's wasteful. On, on other fronts, China is building alliances, that's more successful. Professor Newton. Thank you so much, Martin. This is really interesting. Uh, Diana Newton, I'm a professor here at SMU. So Rob's question about uh, personal financial wealth and your response suggests that uh, if China doesn't uh, bail out these firms, we're going to have unrest, upheaval domestically. Can you talk a little bit about China's surveillance and whether or not any kind of domestic unrest or upheaval could even happen at this point in time? Yes, um, thank you. Uh, Professor Newton, uh, for this for this question, the last time when something similar happened um, was 
2015 when there were there was a turbulent stock market and what we had were um, households losing 10 15 20 percent of their net worth because the um, the stock market uh, was was being turbulent um, there was significant discontent at the time um, so this this hasn't happened on on such a scale um, since then uh, there have been small protests in in certain parts of China where uh, construction firms have uh, delayed construction projects. So we do know that that is possible uh, to happen, um, despite the presence of of the surveillance um, apparatus. Um, I think the big question is whether there could be a nationwide protest. Uh, most scholars in the China field would argue that that's impossible, it will be prevented. Uh, but I mean, if we have, if we, uh, if we get to the point where we have uh, a number of these massive construction companies um, going bankrupt, then, um, then that, that will limit the capacity of the government to prevent it. Um, yeah, but, but thus far, it, it appears that the protests that have emerged have been contained and they have been highly local. Um, so the surveillance apparatus, um, yes, I mean, there, there are hundreds of millions of cameras in China. Not all of them work, uh, which is the tr it, it's, it's true in, in democracies as well, right? I mean, it's like I, I'm sitting in a cab in New Orleans and it says, you're on camera, and I think, okay, fine, you know, but it, all right. Uh, we're on camera all the time, uh, except not all the cameras work. And, and then the, the other issue with the cameras is that even if they work, it's not clear what exactly happens to this footage, how effectively it's used. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to sound Pollyannish, but I, I feel, yes, obviously there's massive surveillance, not only through the cameras, but also by, by reading uh, the, the social media uh, feeds of, of ordinary citizens. Surveillance is not exclusive to China, and surveillance may not be as effective as we oftentimes think. Professor Horrifield. Yes, Martin, thank you for this uh, very informative lecture. I always go away from a lecture wondering if I've learned anything, and you definitely have taught us many things here uh, that I certainly did not know. But you, you seem to be describing a, a paranoid, insecure, almost dysfunctional society, the states losing legitimacy. Sounds like the United States to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're talking about all of these weaknesses. Uh, does China not have any strengths that will allow it to surmount these problems? Uh, that's that's a good corrective. Um, right. So um, right. Um, there. Okay. Well, I worry, <laughs> and um, I was told a long time ago. Um, when I was worrying about passing my comprehensive exams as a PhD student, ah, you worry. Um, and I thought, but if you don't worry, you know, you never study, right? Um, so <laughs> I think it's good to worry. And I actually think that the Communist Party is worried. There are good reasons to be worried. But of course, when an individual or an organization is worried about something, they take actions to prevent the worst. So failing your comps or regime collapse in the case of China. So um, of course, the Chinese Communist Party has extraordinary resources that they mobilize in order to address the problems identified. So for everything that I have talked in terms of economic difficulties, um, the Chinese Communist Party is very actively trying to do its best to address them. Um, in terms of social discontent, um, all of these monitoring mechanisms that are aiming to detect discontent before it's expressed as protests, perhaps they're not the most effective. And of course, there's great variation in how well the system works in different parts of China, but there is a system. Um, and um, at most protests, this is research that I did with one of my uh, PhD students, um, Zhu Zhang, now Professor Zhang, she finished and she got a tenure track position. Um, so what we found um, is that um, in most protests,
protests that occur in China, the police is there immediately. So how do the police know that there would be a protest? They don't necessarily beat up the protesters, but, but they're there. So all of this suggests that the surveillance apparatus, although not fully perfect, is, is operating uh, reasonably, reasonably well. Um, and for all the concern about cultural threats from the outside, the Chinese Communist Party is assiduously working at uh, promoting Chinese culture. So I feel that, yes, for all of these areas of concern, um, of course, um, uh, the, the Communist Party is not just sitting idly by. And um, yes, it, 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 still has, it still has a lot of reserves, but, but the question is for how long? So um, about 20 years ago, when I met uh, Professor Takeuchi uh, in China for the first time, I also started teaching um, Chinese politics. And at the time, uh, my favorite game with students was how much longer will the Chinese Communist Party last? And I'm embarrassed to say that I was, an, I mean, depending, I mean, I don't know whether I was pessimistic or optimistic, but at the time, this was 2004, the idea was the party has at most another 10 years. And I said, no, it's considerably more resilient than that, probably 15. Okay, <laughs> so that was 2019. And at this point, we all assume that the party will last it's it's lasting. We just don't know for how long, but it's 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 going to last for a while. And I certainly don't know uh, if and when it will collapse. So, um, but I mean, at some point, uh, one of these problems could become an unmanageable crisis, um, and you know, people can get out into the street. Um, that that is possible. Um, of course, there are all sorts of elite leadership dynamics that I said nothing about because I feel, I mean, there, there are people who work on elite politics in China. Um, it's very hard to know um, whether we have truly detected something and convincingly established that this is what is driving it. Um, but um, elite politics matter, even if we don't fully understand uh, the drivers of elite politics, there could be crises at the elite levels. So. Uh, Yes, so although the party is, is quite strong, the future is always uncertain. Dr. Chu. Yeah, there's a microphone there. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you for your insight. But since you mentioned the Taiwan uh, situation, both my wife uh, are from Taiwan. So I feel like I can tell you something that you may not know. Because Xi Jinping already when he met President Biden, he already mentioned 2027, 2035, there's no war. I mean, they are not. So if you visit, we, my wife and I just came back from Taiwan and there's nobody think about war or they're just life as usual. And my thinking is stop talking about this war that's dangerous. You know, it seems like it's all inflammatory. You know, like uh, Nikki uh, Healy, you know, at the even at the presidential debate, she mentioned, oh, Taiwan is so dangerous. Actually, it's not dangerous, you know. What do you think? What, what do you comment on this? Well, I certainly hope that you are correct and that there will be no war. Uh, but we, of course, have to hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Um, so the Chinese military modernization is proceeding apace. Um, that's a fact. Um, I also went to Taiwan this summer, and some of the people that my group met with were quite concerned about the war uh, to the extent where they were organizing civilian defense forces. They were teaching ordinary citizens on how to survive during a period of occupation, how to provide first aid. Um, and, you know, that was a concerted effort. Now, of course, I mean, this entity was linked to the DPP. So the DPP, um, the party currently in power, is not particularly friendly to the mainland and they are concerned. Um, yeah, let's hope. I um, mean, 2027 is seen as the year when the Chinese military may be ready for an invasion. Being ready doesn't mean that the invasion will be undertaken. And if it's undertaken, it's not clear whether it would be, whether it would be successful. Um, 
But um, I mean, a lot of this depends on what happens in January in Taiwan, what happens here in November, and other unforeseen events. Um, but when we think about war, I mean, I didn't think that Putin would invade Ukraine either. And he did, right? Um, and I remember being on a plane back from Germany where somebody told me, oh, no, no, he's definitely invading. And the person knew what he was talking about. And I said, oh, please, that's irrational. <laughs> so, and, and this is linked to uh, Professor Takeuchi's question. I mean, so, now sometimes these, these policy decisions, I mean, they, they might actually be irrational. They may, they may, at least they might appear to be irrational. So, um, so certainly um, greater engagement is, is important. It's, 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 it's very important that uh, President Xi and Biden met. Let's see what happens in January. Hello. Uh, you seem to have learned a lot about um, communists and stuff and politics, and you've written so many books. Um, so I'm curious, why are you so interested in the topic? And then, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of information and do you have a goal with them or what are you going to do with them? Like, where are you going? Do you have a plan? Oh, uh, yes. Thanks. I mean, this is sort of like in the self-confessional mode. Uh, okay. <laughs> so why am I interested in communism? Uh, because, um, it has to do with, I think who I am and when and where I was born. So I was born in Bulgaria in 1975 when Bulgaria, you know, a country in Eastern Europe, was ruled by the Bulgarian Communist Party, which appeared on this one slide as 10% of the population is, as its members. So I grew up um, in, in, in the very late years of communism when the system wasn't particularly repressive um, and it collapsed in 89. So I was 14 when the Berlin Wall fell down and I didn't understand what had happened. And I still don't fully, right, although I've written quite a bit about it and I've thought about, about a lot about it. And then I went to college and I discovered China and I thought, this is amazing. So there's a communist party with a market economy and it hasn't collapsed, right? And then the 5,000 years of history and the impossible language and all that. So it was, it was a, 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 for me personally, a wonderful angle from which I could think about my own life experience. Um, and of course, you know, China, I mean, there, there's so many uh, amazing questions that, that are interesting. And I didn't talk about other communist regimes today, but in terms of my research, it's always comparative. So it's China compared to other communist regimes. Where I'm going from there, um, I don't know. I think, uh, I hope I can, I can keep uh, writing about, about China. I think I'm, um, the, the, the next thing that I'm doing is fully about China. So on the adaptability of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so, the book after that maybe about property transformation in communist regimes, uh, with China being one of the main cases. But you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I do believe the future is uncertain. So I don't, I don't really know where I'm going next, but I think China will be an important part of it. Um, so communist regimes are fascinating. It's, it's the longest lived type of non-democratic regime in history. They have, they have survival mechanisms that other non-democratic regimes do not have. And I mean, I think in, in all of my work, I have made an effort to emphasize that thinking that communist regimes survive because they repress is reductionist. Of course they repress, but that's, that's only a part of the answer as to how they survive. They do a lot more than repress. And these adaptive strategies that I talked about today are very important in understanding them. Okay. Uh, Lee Thank you. This has been fascinating. I'm Lynn Novak. I'm a fellow here at the Tower Center and involved with various committees on foreign relations, too. Um, my question is about the stealth use of aggression, mm -hmm. extraterritorial aggression uh, that China is practicing um, with things like police stations in the United States, TikTok, mm -hmm. uh, Huawei, and of course, you've got all the stuff going on in the South China Sea. And uh, I have a home in Chile. I see a lot of Chinese doing things down there. Um, 
it's just very interesting to watch how they're spreading. And one of the things I wondered was the the possible authoritarian kind of um, disappearance or arrests or extraditions of Chinese diaspora citizens around the world uh, based on whether it's the Chinese police stations or other means. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, right. Uh, I mean, everything that you mentioned is very concerning. Uh, there is a report from uh, the State Department has this global engagement center that produced a report about six weeks ago that is talking about these issues, uh, including the overseas police stations and the, the, the repatriation of, of Uyghurs and other Chinese citizens back to China, including about um, Chinese media influence, which I think is very concerning because it's it's hidden oftentimes, uh, whether it's direct ownership, content sharing agreements, or other ways of influencing media content. Um, individuals banned from TikTok, all of that is there. It's all politically explosive. Uh, scholars don't work on it um when the report on the overseas police stations was first um, circulated by safeguard defenders the idea was that this is all made up it's not made up um and 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 there were these accusations of sloppy sloppy work and and so on and so forth and um, somebody even pulled the race card. Um, so I, I think, you know, these are, these are tough conversations. They're very difficult to have given the economic stakes of the bilateral relationship. Um, the report is good. <laughs> the Global Engagement Center, so they, 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 uh, it's a new entity in the State Department um, and uh, they have this report on China they're also working on Russian disinformation activities around the world. Um, so they, um, they, um, they, uh, they do interesting work. Um, and it's a 40 page report. Um, yeah. Well, this is actually, um, yeah, so you had a hand originally. So the last one. So what would happen if Xi Jinping died? What would change? <laughs> Well, that would be uh, an interesting note to, uh, to end on. Um, if he were to die tomorrow, which of course I don't wish that on, on anybody, uh, including on, on Xi Jinping, but if he were to die suddenly, um, there would be a great disorientation at the top because he has accumulated so much power. So there would be a power vacuum. What Professor Takeuchi and I grew up with uh, as, as China scholars is the problem of leadership transition and the importance of having a clear successor. There's no clear successor uh, in China. Um, however, if he were to die, a successor would be found. And what is not clear is whether that successor would be more liberal. Um, so it's interesting for us, I think, to go back 10, 12 years ago. So right before Xi Jinping assumed power, there was this notion that he would be a liberalizing force. He would be China's Gorbachev. I had Wei Jingsheng at a small dinner in Beijing. Wei Jingsheng was um, imprisoned for arguing that China, in addition to having four modernization, needs a fifth democracy. So he's this political activist. And he said, oh, you know, I know his brother. You know, Xi Jinping is China's Gorbachev. Well, turns out he wasn't. So the question is whether uh, Xi Jinping's successor would be as authoritarian more authoritarian or less because i mean we could imagine somebody even more authoritarian than xi jinping and um that's that's unclear i mean i think there's similar questions about russia because the idea is what happens when putin is killed for instance well uh, again a, a, a transition vacuum and uncertainty about the future whether 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 the country would move in a in a more liberal or in a more authoritarian direction Thank you for the question. It's an interesting one. To think well, uh, this is a, um, a last event of the Sunstar program this year, uh, and I'd like to uh, thank uh, our staff members. Uh, Astrid is here. Um, everybody knows her. Uh, also, uh, uh, Executive Director uh, Jenny Apelti. Um,
financial uh, manager uh, Ray Rafidi, and then also uh, um, student affairs manager, and then as also uh, uh, Tower Scholars uh, program uh, manager um, Lauren um, Lauren Kelly. As, uh, I thank uh, all of the Tower uh, Tower Center uh, staff members. Um, so uh, for the end, uh, please uh, join me for uh, thanking Dr. Dimitrov. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming.